Hello, hello. I'm here today in the tier 9 pan European or Dutch destroyer, the Friesland. We're here today on the map loop and the mode is domination. We're in what looks to be 8 to 9 matchmaking. No, actually, it's 7 to 9 matchmaking. There are a couple of unlucky tier 7s. So we are fortunate enough to be top tier. Now, the Friesland is the I want to say original Pan-European destroyer, but that honor actually belongs to the Bliskovica at tier 7, but uh, following the change of the Bliskovica from a Polish to a Pan-European destroyer, with the kind of introductory of the Pan-European destroyer concept, the Friesland was the first high-tier Pan-European offering. Now the Friesland, as you might see on the screen, just from a glance is a very large destroyer, tier 9 destroyer of course, with a rather low hit point pool. She is of course a post-war destroyer, and that's what gives her her very modern look if you take a glance over her structure. She is a post-war destroyer from the uh, 50s and 60s, and is a, in this case, an anti-submarine and anti-aircraft destroyer. Now in the game she appears as the only destroyer thus far to be armed with zero torpedoes. That's the first thing you should note. She only has her twin guns, uh, two twin 120mm or 4.1 inch turrets, for those of you in Imperial. They are 360 degree rotating turrets, so kind of free rotating, especially the rear turret. As you can see here, they turn quite quickly as modern turrets and they fire at a rate of 1.4 shells per second. This is of course with BFT and reload module. Now the Friesen herself is a fairly bulky ship, lacking torpedoes. She plays a bit more like a small light cruiser than an actual destroyer. So she has low HP and fast firing guns, two twin guns. Now the guns when I do fire them are going to have fairly lazy uh, almost American or British arcs in terms of their shell arcs, but she's fairly capable in terms of firepower. Not the most powerful gunboat, you certainly don't want to fight something like a Kitakazi or Mogador necessarily, but she's capable of defending herself. You can see she has a pretty extensive consumable set, standard damage control for destroyers, 40 second cooldown and 5 second duration, and a smoke screen. This is an American one in variety, so a very long action time, 30 seconds with a dispersion time of 127 seconds, so the smoke will last uh, over 2 minutes once you get the puffs fully ticked out. Now before we move on from to the rest of the consumables, you'll note that she has a very high detective ability, relatively speaking. She has 6.4, so this puts her well above the 5.9 of, say, Kitakazi, or even the 5.8 uh, of a Fletcher class destroyer, and just under the thunder chunkers of, say, the I believe it's 7-0 of the Mogador at her tier. You can see me using the, the uh, rather low engine power to get out of the way of that triple two. It kind of tells me the Akatsuki here, and Akatsuki is actually one of the few destroyers that actually match in this position. I'm gonna run at him and pop my next consumable, which is of course a Hydro Acoustic. If reason is equipped with a Hydro, I'm going to start taking my smoke because I don't want to take too much fire from the MTG. And this Hydro is a standard cruiser Hydro, so 5km action radius for ship spotting and 3.5 for torpedo spotting. See me committing quite significantly. I'm going to just duck out of the way of these Akatsuki torpedoes. And just light up that Akatsuki. However, with the FTG there, I don't really want to push him that much. I want to get lit up by secondary. I have a two minute duration on the Hydro Acoustic time, so if he just wants to sit there, that's just fine. Here, now you can see me using the withering firepower of 1.4 second guns. Now, this guy's pretty broadside, so I'm going to switch over the AP for a bit. He's already on fire anyway. And you'll see that damage quickly begin to rack up. No real torpedo threats. The only one kind of close by is inside my Hydro, so I doubt he's going to try anything. He does appear to be trying to leave. Which I will not allow. Oh, 
with the HE is nothing special, but with this kind of rate of fire in a close range, such as inside my hydro range, well, I'm gonna eat him. Hold back into my smoke. Get on the edge of my hydro. So I'm gonna have to pursue outside. Remember, we have 6.4 spotting just like me. JB's gonna finish him off. Enemy freeze in the distance. Now push aside, you can see me. Once I start up, it's rather difficult for me to stop my ship exchanging and fire with that enemy freeze. I'm gonna kite away. Now, in addition to having a fast rate of fire, the freeze has an impressive 9% fire chance. Which is, however, quite sluggish. So, open water gunboating is not exactly your specialty. I've double fired now, so that's gonna prompt a damage control. Secondaries of the FTG. Kind of harassing me in that regard. My hydro's down, there's an enemy you mowing the distance. It's pretty low, but I'm not gonna be able to finish him off. The low velocity of my shells means that I'm unlikely to be able to get into the range. Shut off the AP on the FTG superstructure very briefly there. There's an enemy freezing, don't want to necessarily tangle with him. Now last but not least, we have a defensive fire consumable, Yukimo Torch is sliding past. Do note that I'm moving at a very fairly slow clip, about 33 knots while maneuvering. And remember I have high concealment, you can wait for that Drake to pass by and kind of move towards the freeze and close the gap a little bit. Don't want him to slip away into concealment, do note that my gun angles are rather poor, I have to expose quite a bit of broadside, as you can see there. He's exchanging fire with me, but it's one turret versus two, and he's quite a bit lower health. But do note that any damage I take here is going to stick onto me because I don't have any kind of sustained tools like a heal or such. This bash of the Friesland, which will clean up the spawning. You have to be careful. If this Drake has Hydro Houston, he'll be able to easily spot me out. And I do not have any means of dissuading him from rushing at me because I don't have torpedoes. Gadja kind of running at him, which is a. Uh, Decidedly unwise. Now speaking of the HE that we were just firing, he does the Drake does have hydro by the way. 1750 on the HE Alpha. And 2100 on the AP Alpha. Not the greatest munition. My Gajan Mada is gonna die, so it'd be nice to get out of the way. Let's see if I can disengage over back to this rock. Oh he's gonna beach himself, which is good for me. I'm actually just afraid of the Prince Eugen shooting me. This hydro ends. And with that said, my smoke fire range is 3 kilometers, so I can actually just pop this smoke quite quickly here. And I can fill them full of holes. Now you can see here the Drake. Oh, okay, I'm being radared by the Missouri. Let me just slide a bit out of range. Alright, never mind. Missouri is advancing on me, so I'm not gonna be able to range him out. But, even in spite of my sluggish size, you can see here, starting and stopping takes a significant amount of effort. Oh, shoot, one of those. Okay, I think there's a torpedo warning indicator from someone behind me who is doing something absolutely ridiculous. Missouri fires. Goes dark. Oh, what a disappointing game. Not the cleanest. Only managed to get off 4300 or 43,000 damage because the game ended rather prematurely. The enemy team did kind of get their. Uh, get pushed in and pushed them around a little bit, so. wasn't able to do so much and didn't even get to finish explaining. 43,000 damage though. 163 shell hits, 2 in caps, 1 kill, 3 fires, 1 capture, and 3 spotting ribbons. Hit score wise, as you saw me glance uh, at the top, but not particularly demonstrative. And as because no torpedoes, uh, pretty much only gun damage in this case, a mix of HE and AP, but you're going to be firing AP most of the time, obviously. Before we continue on, since this first game was disappointing, Let's take a look at the modules. So here's the Friesland import. As I mentioned, she's a very large post-war destroyer. If I compare it to a similarly tiered destroyer such as, say, 
that's nearby. Even if I just look at the Daring, which is another post-war destroyer, fairly similar in size, another large ship. But if we go back toward a more wartime design, such as... Where's my Benham? Say the Benham. Compare her to the Friesland again. Okay, maybe Benham's not the right ship to compare to because the Benham's also a fairly tall ship. But if I compare to, say, an Akatsuki, you can see the freeboard between the Akatsuki's hull and the water is somewhat less of a distance than that of the Friesland, which has significant amounts of freeboard. Anyway, my point is that she's large and impressive. Now, aside from her guns, we were getting finishing up her consumable set, uh, which does include a defensive AA fire, and AA is in fact something that's very impressive on the reason. If you look here at her AA stats, she has her dual purpose main battery, but in addition to that, she has these 40mm single bofors. These are post war bofors mounts, so they're rather potent, and these all together give her a total continuous damage of 344, of which um, 312 of that is made up of the mid-range aura, which typically is the strongest aura, and now they're at 162 on the long range. And this AA is in turn reinforced by her access to defensive fire, which gives her quite a punch, especially for a tier 9 destroyer. Now module-wise, pretty obvious, you only have two turrets, they're fairly fragile, basically unarmored, 6mm of armor, so you want main armaments in slot 1, hydro in slot 2, slot 3, uh, you can kind of choose between the aiming systems or AA, I think both are fine. The A module here is pretty bad, but honestly, if you're going to put it on any ship, it should be some kind of destroyer with high AA rating, so Friesland's kind of the perfect test bed for that. And then propulsion module in slot 4, as I started to mention, the engine is very sluggish, especially, and you get to start and stop a lot because you're stopping in your American smokes to stop and farm. Concealment module in slot 5 is a no-brainer. Your concealment's already fairly poor at 6.4, even fully spec, so you don't want it to be any worse. And last but not least, main battery modification. Uh, if you saw how floaty the arcs started getting even out to around 8 or 9 kilometers, uh, they're extremely hard to use, so there's no point. Adding range and adding AA, while it sounds tempting, is definitely not worth it. In this case, you want to emphasize your only weapon that's available to you. Build-wise, very simple. Uh, now, for the Friesland, I do like priority target rather than the usual preventative maintenance. Just lets you know when you can take some risks of being aggressive open water. When you are as slow as the Friesland and as large as the Friesland with a fairly low hit point pool of 20,000 or just over 20,000, uh, having PT, PT tell you when you're able to aggress is pretty nice. Uh, after that, you want to get Last Stand, she's a destroyer after all, and then Survivability Expert followed by Concealment Expert, so that's 10 points. From there I'd probably go BFT, and then I've opted for RPF for my next points, and I'm going to finish with Adrenaline Rush. Now if you don't want to take RPF, uh, my suggestion would be to go into Demolition Expert with that high rate of fire. Demolition Expert is an excellent investment, and your last point you can round off with the preventive maintenance that you don't end up taking with my first choice of power target. And uh, since we have the armor view out anyway, 19mm extremity, 13mm superstructure, 6mm armor on the turrets, nothing special whatsoever. So as I was saying, Friesland's kind of more similar to a small light cruiser than a destroyer. But because of her access to hydroacoustics, she's still able to function as a very effective cap bully. Especially when she has her way uh, and is top tier against a ship like the Akatsuki, which actually doesn't beat her in concealment. Now at her tier, so against her tier 9 peers, she does actually lose to pretty much everyone. Except, say, the Mogador at 6... at uh, 7.0, sorry. Even the Z46 has 5... I believe it's 5.9 concealment and 5 kilometer hydro. And then Utland is 5.7. Fletcher is 5'8", even Kitakaze, who matches you in gun power, but has uh, different features. A uh, worse smoke and no hydro, for one, has 5'9 concealment, so at 6'4 you are definitely one of the worst. Anyhow, loading up into the 6th match, pure tier 9 matchmaking. Uh, enemy only has 3 radars, and I say only, very lightly. 
And they also have a Z46 Yugumo in Freeze and Yugumo 5-5, Z46 5-9, and an enemy Freeze smashing me at 6-4. Now even though you have fairly good AA, you do usually want to start with your AA turned off. There's no carrier in this game, but just in case there were, you have a 2.3 kilometer detectability by air, so no point in wasting that. I do have a clanmate in my game, but he's on the opposite side, so no point worrying about that. Since I spawned above A on the map trap, I am going to start by contesting A cap. A cap's a pretty popular uh, destroyer contest, or sorry, cruiser contest cap, because you can just hide behind this rock on this side. And with my hydro acoustic, even against the likes of a Yugamo or a Z46, you can launch quite a barrage of torpedoes. Uh, you can get some good work done. The hardcover will allow you to overcome your weakness of pretty poor natural concealment by forcing the enemy ships to come quite a bit closer than they might otherwise. I'm now at my top speed, 36 knots. But without any access to a speed boost, I do have to be a little bit careful. It is uh, quite difficult for the Friesland to disengage uh, at will. So my Venom is actually coming to support me. Nevertheless, I still am going to be cautious. My RPF is telling me that the closest ship is still out at about this vector. Georgia shows up. It's unlikely a Georgia and Musashi would come here without any backup, and there is indeed a buffalo in this gap, so time for me to get behind the hardcover. Once the buffalo pops his 10km radar, I would like to be unavailable for shots. Enemy Yugmo's inside of B. My buffalo is charging in with a radar. We'll see how successful he is. Two battleships are down here, we can easily shoot him. I'm expecting to see shells streak out across the map. I'm gonna lock my turrets so I can actually look. I'm hydroed. So that's the Z hydro. So the Z is uh, right here ish. Oh, it's not a Z, it's a Friesland. Okay. Well, anyhow, I'm behind hardcover. I can't fire my frontal turret, but my rear turret is perfectly available to fire. Uh, there's plenty of buffalo broadside, so no need to waste this opportunity. I'm gonna use my AP while I can. AP Alpha is always better than HE Alpha on almost all ships, unless your name is uh, well, an Italian tech tree cruiser. Okay, some nice superstructure pens, even with just my rear gun. Let's see if I can back out a little bit, push him away a little further. Oh, looks like my butt's sticking out a little too much. I'm just gonna move forward. Propulsion module coming into handy there. Again, the buffalo still broadsiding me. Apparently, he thinks getting chipped down by tiny, tiny little Friesland shells is fun. So, this game I get to show off some of that AP that I started using on the FDG that first match, but uh, I had to switch over to HG. Now we're relatively outmatched here. For now, my team has yet to catch up to me. Okay, that's definitely going to be able to hit me. And you can see it's fairly low engine power, and I lost rudder. Uh, we did trim a nice 10k off, however. No need to damage control, not really turning, and I'm only relying on my engine. Angle in a little bit. Continue harassing the buffalo. I switch over to the HE, gonna try for a fire. Now there's a Musashi pushing the corner, and now most destroyers would be very happy to see this because you just give them a face full of torpedoes, but remember I don't have any torpedoes. Buffalo attempting a blind fire. Switch to AP. Now I don't have any particular special pen properties, unlike say a Harugumo or a Kitakaze, or sorry, a, a Kabarosk, not Kitakaze. 
However, I don't have a real way to push, or push him off, rather. Including my frontal gun, Musashi's angling in. Have to go for superstructure AP, opting for AP because he's already on fire. So the AP, even in overpens, will give me more consistent damage. Don't want to get shot at all. He does fire off at me in that brief second that I'm spotted. He fires the Velt reticle lock on, however, as indicated by my pri by my priority target, so I'm gonna easily survive. I have enough of a support team back here that I can keep holding this corner. And you can see here I'm playing very much like a super small light cruiser. At this point I'm gonna pop my hydro. Enemy destroy was a freeze I only have one gun here, remember? I'm gonna pop my smoke. This is because of course I have allies to provide spotting from his firing bloom. He breaks my only rare turrets, which is gonna prompt a damage control. I'm gonna use that uh, what's it called? The 360 capability of my turrets to bring the rear one online after sliding out of the way. He's trying to get into hydro range for me, but even if he hydros me, I'm gonna hydro him back. We have the exact same hydro. He's not a Z46 or a Z52, sorry, with a 6 kilometer hydro. And at this point, he's screwed because he's spotted by his gun bloom, so I don't know what that was about. Maybe he wants to support this FDG that's pushing the corner, but. I have plenty of other, there's a Benham here with me, remember, who does have a uh, torpedo set. Again, broadside target. No need to use the HE unless I have to. Might as well take advantage of that casemate AP while I can. Buffalo sliding out around on the other side. Don't have to worry about him yet. Honestly, I'd be very content to let him go. Getting some ricochets as the FTG begins angling, so switch over to the HG, now we go for fires. My allies dispatch the FTG with 9% shell chance and 1.4 second reload. Easily able to set a fire. And my American smoke still up for another minute. Blocking line of sight and keeping me nice and safe. Looks like this guy doesn't have fire prevention, so I'm trying for that second superstructure fire. But you can see, even at 8 kilometers, that uh, battleship target suddenly starts to become much, much more difficult to lead compared to when he was at 6 kilometers in distance. I'm starting to miss shells already due to the lazy nature of the arcs that are coming back down from orbit. My stock range of 12.3 is pretty respectable, but honestly, you, you don't want to be shooting past around uh, 6 to 7 kilometers if you can't help it, as you start to get shit like this. The fire has timed out, or he damage controlled, one of the two, don't really care which. I'm just going to continue to harass superstructure and farm what I can. He's close to the edge of my effective range, even though I have 12.3 kilometers of range, my effective range is probably closer to 12.5. He's trying to get that last fire, he fires off his rear guns at me in retribution. I'm basically not moving, as does occur. But we've eliminated all our enemies from the cap, so time to finally claim our prize of the cap itself. Been holding down left mouse button for so long, my index finger is starting to hurt. 292 shells thus far. And the Georgia flees the battlefield. I'm going to swing in to just get my fair share of cap contribution, but what's left of the enemy team has been corralled into a rather tiny corner at the top of the map. And I'm going to get 5 seconds of capture contribution. Having taken the cap, I'm going to detach from the Benham. But without a speed boost, I'm not going to be able to get over to this cluster very quickly. Now, they still do have a Seattle and Dmitry Donskoy. In the north, my Kitakazi does go down to a Z46 Hydro combined with Allied Fire and Radar. He seems uh, a little upset with his Georgia buddy. But his death is going to buy me some more time. We are in the lead, of course, with three caps at the moment. Donskoy's charging at B. 
probably going to attempt to capture. But there's an Iowa on my team, and even if the Iowa is not the brightest player, uh, there's no way a Donskoy should be able to take an Iowa at close quarters. I don't know if he's going to go for the gap or go down here. If he goes down here, he's actually going to be a significant threat to me, so I do need to be careful. The Donskoy, of course, is a Russian light cruiser with a 12km Russian radar and more than enough high explosive firepower to uh, take chunks out of my remaining 15,000 health. Sadly, I don't have Adrenaline Rush on this captain yet. I'm one point off being able to f take it and finalize my build. But I still have most of my consumables. I've only used one Hydro Charge and one Smoke Charge. Okay, the Donskoy appears to be beaching, which is very odd. Nevertheless, I am going to still continue toward him. Okay, he popped his radar very early for some reason, but I'm not concerned at all. Because he's beached and he can't really access me. I guess the Georgia can shoot at me once or twice, but the Georgia has bigger problems. My Benham is, uh, well, doing Benham things to him. And now I know he won't have his radar. Now he still might have a Hydro Acoustic, so I do have to be a little bit careful, but the fact that this Dimitri Donskoy radar is going to be down is great. The Iowa that was holding the cap previously for me is uh, dead, having been quite soundly dispatched. I'm going to continue towards the Donskoy. Now the Donskoy is actually fairly heavily armored for a light cruiser. So we do have to take care. The Georgia's decided to turn around and charge at the Jean Bar. Don't know about that one. So I'm going to see if I can actually just head over to this Benham Smoke, which is also American, and help him out. Alternatively, I could try to ambush this Donskoy, but it feels more prudent to try and save my Benham now. Getting into close quarters with the Georgia seem, may, might seem a tad foolish. Uh, my Ismo should be spotting at this point, in terms of the Donskoy, and the Donskoy just fired anyway, so I'm gonna smoke up, use one more of my smoke charges. I still have one more after this, so not too worried, it's just two battleships left after the Donskoy, and I know he doesn't have radar for another 30 or so seconds, and he has an Ismo to deal with, so. Let's just start lobbing shells into him. Now, he also still does have torpedoes, so I don't want to sit here, but. I'm gonna see when he torps because he gets to give quite a bit of broadside. Donskoy doesn't have great torpedo angles. Now, as as you can see, my 120s don't penetrate his actual raw armor, so I do have to aim for his superstructure, but the Donskoy has significant amounts of that. Pick up another 6,000 damage, but it's fine, even though I used a expensive smokescreen, a valuable asset at this point. I'm probably not gonna need it since this game's about to end with that kill. The enemy buys some time by taking that kill in the north, and probably flipping that cap before we can get up there. But, with 910 points uh, rapidly ticking upwards still with two caps, they're unlikely to be able to do anything. This game is basically over. And for reason, just showing off a very standard cap hold. Not the highest damage total, the Friesen can definitely rack up a lot more if you farm some fires on battleships, but I actually was just holding the corner against uh, a buffalo and the pushing Musashi for the most part, and using a lot of armor piercing, so no percentile based HE damage here. Looking at this, you can see a lot of shatters. This is of course because we have low caliber HE, and high FHE is not particularly relevant. Not that we're taking IFHE anyway. Should be an interesting damage distribution to look at, at the end though in the score screen, because I reckon we have a pretty high percentage of armor piercing shells for our damage. The game's gonna tick out. And this time we're gonna score 79,000 damage. As I mentioned, 300 shell hits of which 100 are non-pens and 49 ricochets as well. 
2 in caps, 1 in actual kill, 3 fires, 5 defender ribbons, 1 assisted capture, and 2 spotting ribbons. Team score wise, however, our contributions were enough to score second from the top. At 1600, not the best game, of course. It was. It looks kind of close, and it was kind of close, but it also kind of wasn't. Detailed report wise, I did fire a large amount of AP when I could. But still, the HE is the more consistent ammunition choice, as you can see by the higher contribution. I try to use AP when possible, and it is better when possible, but HE is just the more consistent ammunition, so it sh is what you should be firing uh, for most situations. Anyhow, uh, I showed off my captain and my modules before. Now, the Friesland is accessible through either the store, uh, if you're a whale, not that being a whale is that bad if you can afford it, or through the tech tree for the uh, free experience price. Uh, she is available of course for the price of 1 million free experience and 1 credit and 1 port slot. And she comes with no captain and well no modules or anything whatsoever. She's a premium ship so you don't need to upgrade any modules. But at 1 million free experience, she now has competition in the form of this small end at 2 million free experience. So the small end is a ship I've covered quite recently. The Friesen has existed for a while. Now between the two, uh, I would say the Friesen is definitely more worth the cost. 1 million and 2 million are both extensive free, free experience costs that take a while to accumulate. You can see after purchasing my small end, I still have not quite climbed back up to the 2 million. So I would say if you can only afford to get one or one of the two, Friesland is the better choice as a tier 9. She's a full premium as opposed to a pseudo premium. You can see here the silver icon with the gold border that marks the small end as a reward ship rather than the gold icon with gold border that marks the Friesland as a full premium. And as a full premium, she is going to make uh, more credits than the small end with com com comparable performance. So she's a better credit earner and an easier to use trainer. However, for the upcoming pan-European line, the small end is a direct kind of extension of the line. So she's more analogous to the tech tree tier 10, the Holland, for example. And she, because she has torpedoes just like the tech tree ships and the Friesen doesn't on the other hand, the small end is a better overall captain trainer for the line. So if you're looking for a captain trainer, the small end is going to be a superior captain trainer. However, she costs twice as much. So if you're looking lo just for one premium and offers bang for your buck, the Friesen is definitely the way to go. Now there is also the Bliska available for coal slash money, uh, but that's another story entirely. She's completely different from the other pan-European destroyers. The Friesen at least shares the same guns that the high tiers use and the relatively sluggish post-war hull, but she has that trait of being more like a cruiser than a destroyer. So the small end is definitely more of a destroyer offering, whereas the Friesend, as I've demonstrated over the past two games, because of her American smoke and hydro, tends to sit around and kind of farm and forces her way into caps and contests, uh, not with her stealth, but with her rather large amounts of firepower and powerful hydro and smoke combo. Uh, she plays somewhat like an upgunned Lo Yang, since the Lo Yang has rather poor gun power, or rather poor torpedo power, relatively speaking. So if you're familiar with the Lo Yang, the Friesland is quite similar in that regard. Anyhow, the Friesland is definitely a pretty good carry boat. Like you saw, the first game ended pretty prematurely, but the second game I was able to contribute quite well. Uh, I needed help from my allies, of course, because I don't have torpedo power, so if those battleships decided to actually push the corner, then I would have been in trouble if that Benham wasn't there. But when you put yourself in the right situations, the Friesen is certainly quite a monster. Not a traditional destroyer in most senses, but still a very adequate scout uh, that packs formidable gun power. Anyhow, I thought it would be good to revisit the original high tier pan-European premium, now that we have a pan-European line, and show her off. Uh, but with that said, I'll catch you all later, and I hope you enjoyed. Cheers!